first or second semi final uh, if we are going to encounter the teams of Liège and Vienna. So the kind of four. May it please the court. Mr. President, member of the court, my name is Marie Bedex, and I appear, and I appear together with my learned colleague, Zoe Leban, for the plaintiff Eboris in this matter. We intend to speak 10 minutes each. Our client requests that you grant him an axio processio against Britannicus, the defendant in this matter. This claim is divided in two branches. The payment of a 200,000 solidity penalty for rejecting the arbitrator's decision and the payment of a 2.5 million solidity as withdrawal payment. I will personally address before the court the first branch of the Axel Processo, the payment of the penalty that amounts to 200,000 solidity. Our first and main submission concerning this first branch is that Britannicus should pay the agreed penalty as he breached an obligation that was combined with a penalty clause. Our second submission is that the arbitrator's decision respected the legal requirement and led to a proper arbitral decision, because the arbitrators were independent and because the dispute arose before the beginning of the arbitrator's office. I will now address before the court our first submission, that the defendant shall pay the 200,000 solidity penalty. The clause, named by the Greek letter Zeta, establishes that dispute between members would be submitted to arbitration and that each member promised to pay a penalty of 200,000 solidi if it should fail to abide by the decision of the arbitrators. We submit that, as per the second part of this clause, the defendant shall pay the agreed penalty as he refused to comply with the arbitral decision, deciding that his withdrawal was effective. Well, it says that the withdrawal, but the penalty is payable for disputes about to arise under the Pactum Romanum. Withdrawal relates to the Pactum Municipality. So why should we read this to the point here? Thank you for your question, Mario. It is our submission that after um, uh, the... Um, but a, uh, the fourth clause of the Pactum Romanum, it was already um, uh, stated that it could be altered from time to time. In addition, when the Pactum Lusitanicum was entered into, the members of the group were aware of the fact that it would alter the Pactum Romanum, and that dispute arising under this new pact would fall under the scope of the arbitration clause. But doesn't the Pactum Lusitanicum create a whole new partnership? No, it is an additional... Uh, um, it is an addendum to the uh, uh, Societas Agreement. Can you modify a contract in this way with a pact down the line? As it is uh, provided by the Pactum Romanum itself that it could be modified, yes we can. It is our submission. And so should they have wanted to avoid this, that the dispute arising under the Pactum Lusitanicum fall under the arbitration clause, they would have expressly provided it in the Pactum Lusitanicum, but they didn't. So. This clause is a penalty clause, and in order to enforce a penalty clause, two conditions must be fulfilled. Can I ask you something? Wasn't there a time interval, I mean, there was a time difference between the conclusion of the Pactum Rustanicum and the Pactum Romanum. Do you consider that of having any effect in your case? Uh, Does it have to be contemporary, or is it, not, is it trivial to your case, the fact that they're not made in the same time? Um, in this our submission that the difference of time is not a problem because from the beginning they provide that it could be altered from time to time and they already provide that f um, later agreement would alter the, f the first one. Thank you. So, um, there must be uh, two conditions must be fulfilled in order to enforce a penalty clause. There must firstly be an obligation which is secondly not comply with. If those condi two conditions are met, the non-compliant party should pay the agreed penalty. In case, we submit that the defendant had the obligation to comply with the arbitral decision. He nevertheless rejected this decision and wrote to each member of the group to inform them about his unwillingness to respect the arbitral decision. He should thus pay 
the agreed penalty that amount to 200,000 sovereign. Besides, this conclusion also relies on text three of my bundle. This text states that those who choose arbitrators shall do so under a stipulation with a penalty attached in an amount. Did Britannicus Th choose an arbitrator? Excuse me, Councillor. Did Britannicus choose an arbitrator? It is our submission that when the dispute arose, um, Britannicus uh, and the, all the parties of the, and all the members of the group agreed on uh, the arbitrators because the words of the libelous only uh, states that the defendant complied about, complained about the arbitral decision after it was rendered and after he was aware that this decision was against him. So this case states further that they must either abide by the decision or they must first pay the penalty after which they have the right to disobey. Are you aware of any um, legal provision maybe by virtue of which members may have a deadline for objecting to an arbitration award after the um, rendering, after the conclusion of the arbitration. Thank you, my lady, for your question. We are aware of this text, but this text only applies when there is no stipulation that is provided to enforce the arbitration decision. Okay. So this text clearly states that the defendant should first pay the penalty. And this is why our first submission is that the defendant shall pay the 200,000 solid penalty. I will now address before your excellencies our second submission, that the arbitrators led to a proper arbitral decision as they were independent and as the dispute arose before the beginning of the arbitrator's office. Indeed, firstly, the arbitrators were no longer a member of the management committee and the requirement established by text 5 of my, of my bundle, which forbids evident favoritism from the arbitrators, is met. They no longer derived any benefit from the circuit dice, and no longer had decision-making power in it. They indeed knew the parties, but they, know, they knew Eboris as well as Britannicus, we knowing know the parties I'm sorry, do we know that they're not members of the Securitas anymore? We're just told they're not members of the Management Committee. Thank you, my lord, for your question. As per the Alpha Clause of the Pactum Romanum, each member of the group has a vote into the Management Committee. It is thus our submission that former members of the Management Committee should either be former member, members of the Securitas or form of third parties that were only members of the Management Committee but that are no, not members of the Management Committee anymore. In, in, in case they were former members of the management committee, yes. they must have been somehow involved in the in the um, in the decisions they would now be reviewing. So, would that be <coughs> which leading to to evident favoritism? It is our submission that they only decide about the effectivity of Britannicus's withdrawal. They are not involved in this decision uh, in this in the fact that Britannicus decided to um, withdraw from the Societas. So. I was stating, if I may f f proceed in my uh, submission, that they of course knew the parties, but knowing the parties is not a cause of evident favoritism. It actually makes sense for parties to an arbitration to choose someone they know and whose expertise they recognize. The, this submission that they were independent is also corroborated by the seven of my bundle that I invite you to take. If even a son can judge in its father mother, why should former member of the management committee not be entitled to judge in this manner? Isn't it the case in our case here that um, defendant has been constantly and for several, year, several years been voting against the decisions of the management committee because it was contrary to his interest, I take it, from the, from the liberals. So the very members of the committee, of the management committee, against whom he has been voting all these years, are now called upon to decide his case. Thank you, Melody, for your question. But it is not the other members of the management committee that voted against Britannicus. It is Britannicus that voted against the other members Six. of the management yeah, committee. There is a hostility there, isn't it? But should Britannicus have voted for the decision of the management committee, it's the same. He, he was willing to vote and we invited, uh, they invited Britannicus to, to be a member of the circuit as too, but he was not uh, happy with the decision making of the uh, of the circuitas, and that's why he decided to withdraw from the circuitas. Okay, so the fact that he was against the decision so far doesn't create any kind of 
um, implication with regard to the impartiality of the judges, I take it. No, it doesn't change. Uh, they were still impartial because um, they had to choose concerning uh, on, a, on a question of the validity of Britannicus's withdrawal. So this is why the arbitrators were independent. And secondly, in accordance with text 8 of my bundle, the dispute, dis the dispute arose before the beginning of the arbitrator's office. The dispute was only latent at the time of the entering into of the Pactum Musitanicum and still at the time the defendant decided to withdraw from the circuit class. Oh, I see my time has elapsed. May I just have an additional time to sum up my submission, please? Yeah, one minute, yeah. Thank you. So I was stating that the dispute only arose when the defendant decided to declare his withdrawal as being ineffective. Then only the, dis the, dis the arbitrators decided on the issue. And as the legal uh, formal requirements are met, the arbitrators led to a proper arbitral decision, regardless the substance of the, um, of the decision. This proper decision was not by, by the defendant, even though there was a steep, uh, penalty clause stating that a uh, failure to abide by a proper decision of the arbitrators would result to a penalty that amounts to 200,000 solidi. And this is why we are claiming that the defendant should pay this penalty. And if I may not be of any further assistance to the court, this concludes my submission, and I will give the floor to my learned colleague, Zoe Ledon, who will address the second branch of the Axio Processio, the withdrawal payment. May it please the court. I would like to start by thanking my learned colleague, Marie Bedes, for introducing me to this honorable court. I will personally address you on the claim concerning the withdrawal payment. Our submission is that Britannicus has effectively made application of the withdrawal clause. This clause needs to be interpreted in accordance with its purpose. Moreover, in the present circumstances, Britannicus cannot revoke his withdrawal. As a consequence, Britannicus must be sentenced to pay a sum of 2.5 million solidi to the rest of the group. This sum is calculated taking into account the loans contracted in 546, which are free of interest. As to the withdrawal, we submit that it was effective. The Pactum Lusitanicum, which is the latest agreement among the members, allows each of them to leave the group, as you may read in paragraph 3 of the Libus. It sets one formal condition for the withdrawal, that the withdrawing member sends, uh, gives notice in writing to the other members so that they are aware of his intention to leave. In the present case, Britannicus has effectively sent a notice to the other members. So in accordance with the wording of the Pactum Lusitanicum, he has expressed his willingness to withdraw from the group. The destruction of the notice is not relevant here, since it was not commended by Britannicus. As to the other members, they were all notified the withdrawal. The fact that Eboreus did not get the notice sent to him is neither relevant since he was informed of the withdrawal through, through another way, as you may read in paragraph 6 of the Libellus. According to text 1 of my bundle, we stress that one may have to look behind the wording of a contract and focus on the common intention of the parties. Here, the common intention underlying the clause is to make sure that all the other Soki are aware of the withdrawal so that they can take an active part in the negotiations. Indeed, if no notice was given, they might continue acting in reliance of all the partners being, being members of the group. They might not be in a position to assert their rights, and this would, of course, be detrimental for them. So according to this interpretation, we submit that the clause is rooted in the intention to protect the other Soki and excuse their me, rights. Excuse me, um, are you submitting that the reason why the parties opted for identification was to allow um, the countdown of one year for negotiations? 
or rather so as to best calculate the liabilities of the withdrawing member. Thank you, my lady. Our submission is that the aim of the clause is to allow negotiations to go on, so to best calculate the rights and liabilities. And the term of a year that has been set, therefore, is uh, was rather like a time indication in order for these negotiations to take place. So the actual condition is the notice, and the aim of it is that all the members are aware of the withdrawal. So when would this um, one year period begin? When all the members were informed or when just any of them was informed? I mean, isn't this the reason why they opted for a notification in writing? Yes, our submission is that uh, the term of a year starts when all the partners became aware of uh, the withdrawal. So our interpretation is also consistent with the principles of good faith and brotherhood, both essential in a circuitous, as you may read in text 2 and 3 of my bundle. It is also corroborated by text 4. We infer from this text that when there are several possible interpretations, the one that is most complying with the nature of the contract must be chosen. So as all the remaining partners were made aware of the... Excuse me, Council, this text number four says um, that one is most readily to be accepted, which is most suitable to the conduct of the affair. Which affair are you talking about? The remaining of the, in the remaining intact of the, of the Sakiyatas or the withdrawal? Uh, our submission here is that the affair ref refers to rather the contract, the Sakiyatas in itself. Yeah. Yes, so that the nature of such a circuitous is uh, a contract of good faith. So, but it would be favorable for the circuitous if it was not resolved by the withdrawal of the uh, of the other party. Yes, my lord. Indeed, it is our submission that here the circuitous is not uh, dissolved by this withdrawal, as uh, permitted by text twenty one of my bundle, stating that it is sometimes necessary to launch an action on partnership even when the partnership is still in operation. So why is this the case and the case at hand? Because it is only one member withdrawing from the group. So the, we, we submit that the rest, the remainder of the members have the intention to continue the activities in the circuitous. But is this what uh, source number 21 entails? Um, not exactly. It gives uh, an example, but we submit that it can be applied in any case. Okay. But isn't your source 22 to the opposite effect? That it says that once it announces the partnership, the contract is at an end. Thank you, my lady. Actually, this source needs to be read uh, together with the next one, source 23. And in the end, you can read that unless some other provision was agreed in the establishment of the partnership, which, which was the case here. May I proceed? Thank you. So here, the protective aim of the clause has been fulfilled. So I will now address your excellencies with the impossibility for Britannicus to revoke his withdrawal in accordance with text five of my bundle and with the principles of good faith and brotherhood. The Pactum Lusitanicum states that uh, a withdrawal is to be enforced one year after a notification. Such a period makes it possible to conduct negotiations in order to plan the withdrawal. Britannicus has allowed these negotiations to go on for almost a year before deciding that he would rather stay a member of the group. The other partners had already engaged time and costs in the negotiations, they had already taken additional steps in order to prepare the group. Success? Excuse me? Success? Uh, we have uh, in the libelous no indication, but as the negotiations were going on for a year, we submit that it, uh, it makes sense that actually they already took steps towards co-contractors, for example. That's disadvantage already incurred. What disadvantage would follow from the changing of mind? Well, the disadvantage would be that uh, they would have to start this all over again. No, they wouldn't have just continued as a whole, yes. It is our submission that the costs 
were already incurred and that if uh, Britannicus was to stay a member, this, this cost would have incurred for nothing. Right, but those costs have already been incurred. That's not really a disadvantage flowing from the changing of the mind. We're just changing how we think of those costs, they're different being useful to useless. But if we allow him to stay in the partnership, he will not pay the withdrawal payments. Right, so we don't get to exact a penalty, that's, that's the disadvantage. Excuse me? So the loss of being able to enforce a penalty is the disadvantage. Basically, you don't get to punish Britannicus. It's not an idea of punishment, it's an idea of following what has been agreed. It was agreed in the contract that when a member withdraws, mm -hmm. uh, withdrawal payment is incurred. Okay. So here we submit that his change of mind would be detrimental and contrary to text 5. So as to the amount of the withdrawal payment incurred, we submit that it has to be calculated uh, taking into account that the loans contracted in 546 were free of interest. Indeed, Britannicus states that the rate is 8% and this is in accordance with text 8 of my bundle. But this text does not state an obligation, it only states a maximum rate. The aim is to protect the debtors from, a, from an excessively high rate. So parties cannot be reproached for having actually agreed upon a lower rate. Moreover, this text states that the rate of interest can be agreed upon orally, which was the case here. The oral agreement prevails over the written one because it reflects the actual will of the parties. Do you have any evidence for preferring orality to writing? Excuse me? What, why should we prefer what they've said over what they've written down? Uh, because, first of all, what is... Uh, I'm sorry, I see my time is up. May I have a moment? Mm -hmm. Well, what has been written down was not really specified, as no specific rate of interest was said. And what has been actually agreed between the parties is that it would be uh, a rate of interest of 0%. And uh, according to text uh, 12 of my bundle, we state that where there are two um, contradictory <coughs> documents or two contradictory contracts, the truth must prevail. Here the truth is what the parties have actually wanted. So they were lying when they broke down to the interest there. Our submission is rather that they further discussed with the co-contractors co and arrived at a, an agreement for a 0% rate of interest. May I just conclude? Thank you. So, I hope Your Excellencies have our central point in mind, which are the following. Britannicus has effectively left the group as he has duly informed the Soki of his withdrawal. As a consequence, he must be sentenced to a withdrawal payment amounting to 2.5 million soli. Unless I may be of any further assistance to your excellencies, this concludes our submission for the Thank you, Council. So, <coughs> Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Simela Papateofilo and I appear together with my colleague, Ms. Lara Sophie Portsofa. We are participants from the University of Vienna and we will each need roughly 10 minutes for our submissions. I will submit while the first claim is to be dismissed, while my junior counsel, Ms. Portsofa, will submit while the second claim is also to be dismissed. The first claim is the Act of Prozorcio for 200,000 solidi for not abiding by the arbitrator's decision. The claim is based on paragraph Zita of the Pactum Romanum, where each Sorcio is promised to pay 200,000 solidi should you not abide by the proper decision of arbitrators. Which brings up the question whether the decision was even proper. There are several indications in our case for lack of properness. Firstly, every arbitrator was a former member of the management committee. The same organ of the Zakiatas that gave out big loans to friends without specifying an interest rate that keeps its books in such a state that it is impossible to tell from them how much money is owed by whom. 
and the same management committee that would hugely profit off of Britannica's leaving the Societas, thereby paying more than 2 million solidar. It is not in the facts that they are not members of the Societas, as my lone friend for the plaintiff has claimed. My lone friend for the plaintiff also claimed that they must have known Britannica's and that this means that there can't be any favouritism, but this is also not in the facts, as they could have been members of the management committee before Britannica's even joined the group. Opian informs us in Digest 4.8.9.3, which you will find on page 4, section 2 of your bundle, that a corrupt arbiter, one whose behaviour is scandalous, ought not to render an award. The behaviour of the management committee, as I have just briefly described it, can surely be described as scandalous or even corrupt. The role of the aforementioned Digest is supposed to guarantee the fairness and impartiality of the decision of the arbitrators, but in our case they have been neither fair nor impartial. On account of what exactly? Excellent. What is that they did that doesn't it, that creates even the impression that they are corrupt? Thank you for the question, my lady. Um, first of all, <coughs> they are involved in the secure task, so they have an interest in that case, and it is our submission that this contradicts the digest that you will find on page six, section six of your bundle, which is digest four point eight point fifty one where Marcin says that no one is to be arbiter in his own case. And it is scandalous when, wants, when one renders a decision where he has an interest well, in Well, that's not quite what text 6 yeah. says, is it? It says mm -hmm. because no one can either give an order yes. or issue a prohibition to himself. So that's literally you can't decide a matter in which you are a party rather than you have an interest in the case. Thank you for the remark. It is my um, submission that when we look at both digests at the same time, um, we can see that when one has an interest in the case, then you are, in a way, acting in a scandalous way, aren't you? It's for you to tell us. <laughs> okay. It is my submission that stating that they are former members of the management committee obviously indicates them still being members of the Sukhiatas, as we can also see from the fact that there are other people who used to be in the management committee and are now Suki in the Sukhiatas, for example, Mediolanus. Those submissions show that the decision was improper and why therefore um, the Sukhiatas cannot demand the 200,000 the 200, solidite fine. The word proper was not mistakenly included in paragraph zeta of the Pactum Romanum, but put there with intention. That intention must have been to ensure impartiality and fairness, especially since the Sukhiatas is built on bona fides. It would have been against everything the Sukhiatas holds to appoint arbiters who are not compelled to act in the same way that a good man would. Excuse me, Council, but why didn't your client protest beforehand when he got to know that the arbiters should be former members of the uh, of the management, management co committee. Isn't it a little bit problematic, especially in the context of good faith, when you first wait what the arbiters do and then complain because of their, their former affiliation to the Sukhita? Thank you for the question, Mr. President. It is our submission that it is a perfect example of good faith that he expected them to act impartially and fair, even though they were former members of the management committee. And he didn't suspect them to act in the way that they later on showed that they would act in. But doesn't this then bring us to source three of your uh, opponent's source sheet, uh, stating that in, in case you want to appeal against uh, an arbitrary decision, you have to pay first? What do you make of the, yeah. this argument? Um, I would like to bring against this source the digest which you will find on page 4, section 5 of my bundle, which is the digest 17.2.76-278, where Procula says that there are different kinds of arbiters. And I submit that the source that Mallow Friends for the Plaintiff have got refers to the first kind of arbiter, and that I think that in the case of a partnership, um, the second kind of arbiter is the correct one because the Sukhiatas is, after all, built on one of feeders. And Proculus expressly stresses that in the well, digest. Where, where can I find in, 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 in text number three of your opponent's sources that uh, only applies to this other type of arbitration? You cannot find it expressly stated there that it only applies that it only applies to this, but it is our submission that the text is to be read in this particular way. And why should it be read in this way? 
because the word arbiter can mean both someone who acts as a UDEX and someone who has more the job of an estimator. And it is my submission that this digest that my learned friends for the plaintiff have brought only um, is to be applied in the first case and not in the second. Okay. Thank you. Therefore, we must conclude that the decision is only to be obeyed when it aligns with what a via bonus would have decided. And it is clear that a via bonus would not force a Socius out of a Socius against his own will. Since the Pactum Romanum explicitly states that one only has to pay the fee when not abiding by a proper decision, the argumentum e contrario must be that when one doesn't abide by an improper decision, the fine cannot be demanded. Furthermore, it should be emphasized that Britannicus explicitly linked his not obeying by the decision with the decision's improperness. Furthermore, I also submit to the court the digest on page 7, which is digest. 44.4.4.7, when Laubeo says that if in a claim for a slave, judgment was given that the slave shall be delivered within a fixed period, and a penalty was stipulated should the slave not be delivered, the plaintiff cannot claim both the slave and the penalty because it would be inequitable to claim both. Hence, we submit that the partnership too can also only demand for Britannicus to either pay um, the penalty fee or to pay um, the withdrawal fee. Therefore, the first claim and the second claim contradict each other. Why is that? Here the two are linked. You either get the slave or the penalty. Withdrawal is distinct from the withdrawal payment, isn't it? The penalty, sorry, is distinct from the withdrawal payment. They're not interlinked in the same way. Thank you for your remark. Um, I would like to answer your remark by directing Your Excellency to the Digest 17.2.71, which you will find on the same page, mm -hmm. um, where we have a scenario which is very much like ours. We have partners who form a partnership and they draw up a pactum with all the rules and what they have to do. And they also include a clause for a stipulatio pone, just like this Sukitas did. And here also, Paula states that the members are not in obligation to do as is demanded and to pay the penalty, but to only do either or. And therefore, we submit that should your excellencies decide in favour of the second... Excuse me, excuse me. Has that, even if we you know, follow this uh, provision, that was specifically agreed beforehand? between the members of the partnership, whereas in our case, it was agreed on the contrary, that there would be a penalty if and plus the exit fee. They didn't, they didn't say, they didn't agree that they would do either that or the other. Thank you for your remark. It is our submission that um, if they force Britannicus to leave the Sukhietas, so if he has to withdraw, then he's also forced to abide and then the penalty cannot be demanded. If the penalty is demanded for not leaving the Sukhietas, then one cannot demand of him to pay the money that you have to pay when you leave the Sukhietas. But I think that the plaintiffs have provided us with a provision stating in specific that when there is a stipulatio and there is a penalty, you have to pay the penalty. Unless you were to say that, for instance, this is not a compromise, that this is not applicable in your case, I don't see how you could maneuver around that provision. I don't think that I understood the question correctly. I think that they, they do have a specific provision stating that when there is a stipulation and penalty that and somebody rejects the award, then you have firstly to pay the um, penalty. Oh, thank you. Now I understood. But it is also stated there that when the um, court later on states that you were right and the arbitrators were wrong, you can demand the penalty back. So, so you have to pay it. So do you, do you concede that? I consider that if we pay, if our client paid the money and got it back, it would be of us to no difference as not paying it. So all. would you be paying? If we were sure that we'd get the money back, yes. Alright. Okay. Our final submission as to why doesn't the fine doesn't have to be paid as the whole withdrawal was ineffective. Oh, <coughs> excuse me, I see that my time has expired. Can I have another minute for my final yes. point? My junior counsel will focus on different reasons why the withdrawal has been ineffective, but I want to state that one further reason is that Britannicus was in error at the time where he declared his will to leave the partnership. Um, in the text from the Digest on page 10, which is Digest 19.2.52, Componius informs us that where one is in error about the price of a lease, the lease does not take place. We're concerned with a different legal act in a lease, a withdrawal from a partnership, but the rationale still persists. Britannicus did not know at the time when he declared his will that he would be indebted with such a sum. Therefore, he, like the errant lease and Pomponius text, 
ought not to be found by his declaration. Unless your excellencies have any further question, we submit on the basis of those submissions that the first claim to dismiss. May it please the court. Thank you, Counsel. May it please the court. As junior counsel, my submission for the second claim concerning the withdrawal payment in the amount of 2.5 million solidi will consist of two main points. Firstly, we will argue that in contrast to the plaintiff's submission, the withdrawal has been ineffective. Secondly, we will contend that a claim for a withdrawal payment was unjustly made and that the sum in particular is horrendous. Your Excellencies, by looking at Pactum Lusitanicum, it appears quite clear that for the withdrawal to become effective, the withdrawing member has to send his written renunciation to every other member of the Sukhiatas. Furthermore, the Pactum states that only after the receipt of those letters by every Sukhius, the withdrawal process would start. These criteria, though, have not been fulfilled. Not every member of the Sukhiatas received the notice. Iboreos, the president of the management committee, obviously didn't receive one. So the receipt by all the members has, in contrast to what my learned friend of the plaintiff has said, happened, never happened, and according to the Pactum Lusitanicum, the withdrawal process could therefore not even have started. But the Boris has shown a copy of the notice. He's seen the notice. What's the problem? Thank you for the question, my lord. It is true that, he, that Iboreos was shown a copy by Mediulanus, but we contend that this does not suffice as a receipt such as the Pactum demands. On page 12 in your authorities, your excellencies will find um, the, digest, the text of the digest 22.4.2, which explicitly states that the original is essential, whereas a copy is worthless in comparison. When a person is sued by the Imperial Treasury, Thank are you we dealing with that sort of case here? Thank you for the question, my lord. Um, we submit that the authority level of the whole Sokia task over one person, over one Socius, which is Britannicus, and the authority level of the Fiscus can be compared to. But aren't we dealing in the sex with the contract literus, where the writing is the contract? This is why we draw an analogy to. Okay, but consensual contracts are completely different. Why should we draw that analogy? Because we can compare the authority level of a Fiscus and a whole Socius test. Okay, what about the rationale given? For a vexatious document is not regarded as valid in legal proceedings. Are you calling this copy vexatious? Well, in the view of um, Britannicus, we can call it vexatious. Just because he doesn't like it? No, because um, the withdrawal has been ineffective. It as the Pactum was telling us. It's only states. ineffective if we agree with you that it's vexatious. And it's an exact copy of what your client wrote, so how could this be vexatious? Yeah, but it's just a copy and not the original as the Pactum Lusitanicum states. It doesn't say that, but where does it say original? Well, it says that the receipt of the notice, the notice in the sentence before, the notice in writing to each of the other members, which means that the notice has to be written from, uh, by Britannicus, and after receipt of the notice, so they explicitly uh, so you're state- you that it must be written by the person in person, so you cannot use a slave or someone else to write for you. Well, Britannicus could, of course, um, told a slave to write it, but then it would be a mandatum. But where does it say that he has to write it himself? It says notice in writing. The copy is notice in writing, isn't it? It says a member of the group who wishes to withdraw can do so by notice in writing to each of the other members, mm -hmm. which means that the member who wants to withdraw, which is, Britan who is, which is Britannicus, has to write by notice to the other members. Is it your claim that it was rather sent to Mediolanus, whereas there is no proof that it was sent to Avorius? I mean, so it is stated that the notice, the notice, the copy of the notice was sent to Mediolanus, the one sent to Avorius. So are you stating that it should have been addressed specifically to Avorius? Is that your claim? Well, there was a notice sent to um, Avorius, mm -hmm. but the notice got destroyed. So that, that is your claim? Yes. That he himself never had the Exactly. Receipt. Okay. But do you have standing? Do you have standing to bring forth such a claim? I mean, 
in my view, if anyone could bring this plea stating that I didn't receive the notice, would be a Boris, because he would be, you know, the interested third party. Can your client um, bring forth this, uh, this argument? Well, Eborios hasn't received the notice and it says that the receipt of the notice, okay, which okay, begins... Okay, then but who has the interest to bring this before the court? I mean, if anyone Britannica is injured, because I think it's Eborios, not? You mean because it would be convenient to say that the withdrawal um, should be ineffective, you mean, from the side of... Oh, okay. So thank you for your question, my lady. Um, that might be the case, but not that the attention or will or, or the wish of Britannicus is insignificant, since the wording of the Pactum Musicanico is very clear. The withdrawal process and hence the effectiveness of the withdrawal rely on the receipt of this written notice. May um, In addition, it has to be mentioned that Iboreus as president of the management committee, should be especially well aware of the rules and criteria for withdrawal. To oppose my learned friend for the plaintiff is our submission that Britannicus certainly did not violate the interdiction of the venire contra factum proprium, since he rightly claimed the ineffectiveness the moment he found out about the destruction of the notice. Additionally, in contrast to what my learned friend of the plaintiff said, the purpose of the pactum is not stated in fact anywhere. By saying the purpose of the pactum was filled in defining said purpose, to his advantage, the plaintiff presumes to know the will of all the other parties who agreed to this pactum. Excuse me, because I have to come back to your venere contra factum proprium argument. In the, in the libellus in, in number six, it is said, Britannicus is now unsure that he wants to leave the group, and only afterwards it is said that he discovers that his manager, manager uh, a messenger uh, just did not deliver his message. So uh, wasn't there a change of mind before he finally got grounds, maybe? Thank you for the question, my lord. We submit that there is a difference between being not sure about uh, the withdrawal or deciding explicitly, I want to withdraw. Okay. Um, we argue that it says explicitly and without any ambiguity, a notice must be written, sent and received by all other members. Your Excellencies, we submit that according to the facts, this never happened and therefore the withdrawal could never have been effective. Lastly, my lords and lady, there's one more notion concerning the ineffectiveness of the withdrawal we want to bring before this code. We, sub we submit that since there has been no effective withdrawal, there for sure cannot be a demand for withdrawal fee because the withdrawal procedure cannot heal the missing withdrawal. To conclude, to demand any sum as a withdrawal payment from Britannicus would not only be unjust, but legally impossible since his withdrawal was clearly not effective. Moreover, we submit that the sum itself is a great injustice to what the Sukhitas stands for, the bono fides. As the facts state, the Sukhitas runs a very large bank and is therefore obligated to keep the books in an orderly manner. To support this notion, maybe refer your excellencies to page 14 in your authorities, where you will find the Deutsches, the text of Deutsches 2.13.4. The Sokietas neglected this responsibility when looking at the facts in the case, which cannot be to Britannicus' disadvantage. Moreover, a partnership implies in a sense a law of brotherhood, as my learned friend of the plaintiff already said. On page 12 in your authorities, according to Deutsches 17.2.63, which is why it would have been the truly candid behavior from the other members to intact Britannicus when he joined the group in their in economic doings and in the existence of those large loans. Receiving important information about the group's transactions can be absolutely essential. Additionally, we contend in contrast to what my learned friend of the plaintiff said, that the novella 136.4 is to be applied to our case, which you will find also on page 13 in our authorities. Since it explicitly states that a person interest rate can be demanded even if no interest rate has been specified. We can apply this novella perfectly to our case since the group has a bank and fulfills the task of the bank. Excuse me, but this rather refers to one 
the interest is not specified not to where you have an agreement to the opposite, which is our case, I think. Um, well, the novella 136.4 says the bankers are allowed to, the law permits the bankers are allowed to demand 8% interest rate, even though it hasn't been stipulated, which means that it has the same outcome when there is no rate specified, as, in, as it is in our case. Yeah, the law permits it, but it doesn't demand it. Well, it's the maximum of the 8%. Yeah. And um, can I... Yeah, yes, go? of course, we've yeah. got two more minutes to make it equal for me. From the and um, bearing in mind that we are confronted with a large bank, we can only come to the conclusion that it would be in the best interest of this bank to receive the possible maximum interest rate when giving out large loans. And to support this notion, we would also like to direct your Lord and Lady Ship's attention to what Paula states. Paula states that the partnership has to foremost act in its own best interest, which would be, in our case, giving out loans with interest as opposed to interest-free loans. These loans are made in the year 546, yes? Um, which yes, is exactly. one year after the partnership forms. Yes. What if the bank didn't exist within the first year of partnership? Thank you for the question, my lord. Um, we can see in the facts that there is a bank mm -hmm. and that the bank probably belongs to the Sukhietas because in 564, mm -hmm. we can see in the second paragraph, um, including the running of a large bank. But it doesn't that's, state that's that... That's 20 years after the loans are made. Exactly. Thank you for the remark. Um, the paragraph 2 just... Um, can I go on? Um, just says um, that running of a large bank, not that it started, um, that the Sukiyata started to run a large bank. But so, isn't it paragraph 5 that specifically says that the bank can make a number of very large loans, so we know it is a bank? I mean, isn't paragraph 5 that proves it, that it is a bank? Do we have to go to paragraph 2? Well, it says here it is a bank, but I just wanted to emphasize again right. that here it also states that um, the Sukhitas runs a large bank. <coughs> okay. That's what I wanted to do. Um, <coughs> so, to conclude, the withdrawal payment could only ever amount to 2.25 million solidi for the sole reason that the withdrawal payment has to be calculated on a basis that those loans are interest-bearing. Your Excellencies, unless there can be of any further assistance, those are all my submissions. Thank you, Council. So what's left is the bubble. May it please the court. First of all, we would like to refer to the defendant's allegation that the arbitration was not uh, in conformity with the judgment of a good man. Uh, the text three of the defendant's uh, source sheet on page four actually refers to the case where, um, deals with the case of uh, setting the, sh of uh, deciding about the shares of the soci in the Sukietas. It is a uh, question of formation of the contract and not a question like the one we have at hand of one member withdrawing. I would like to draw your Lordship's attention to text 9 and 10 of uh, the P1 source sheet from my learned colleague. You may see in these texts that um, a arbitration shall be, uh, shall be uh, respected even when it is unfair. So the properness of the arbitration does not regard the substance of the arbitration. It rather regards the persons of the arbitrators. And as my learned colleague said, we, uh, the parties here choose the best arbitrators possible. They choose former members which had a knowledge of the circuit test and its functioning and were best suited for uh, for ruling such a case. Yes, the members of the committee who gave these large amount of loans to its friends and haven't asked them back for the past 20 years. Yes, my lady, it is true, but these, uh, this was not the question at hand in arbitration. The question was rather the effectivity of the notice. Mm -hmm. But now the bankers would be made to pay 
this allowance as well, wouldn't he? He would have to pay this amount, but uh, it is a consequence of his own will to withdraw from the group. And moreover, as he has not um, has not uh, complained about the choice of arbitration before, he has only himself to blame now for choosing these arbitrators, as you may see in text uh, 10, my friends. Now, relating to the allegation of the defendant that the interest rate could not be of 0% because this would not be in the best, best interest of the Sucietas, we would like to draw your attention on the circumstance that Britannicus was not yet a member of the Sucietas at that time. He is not entitled to judge what was the best interest of the Sucietas. Our submission is that these loans could have been granted because at that time it was necessary to strengthen relations with third parties, to attract new investors. These loans were granted at the very beginning of the Sucietas. So our submission is that the defendants... Uh, I'm sorry, my time is up. May I just conclude? You may, may finish your sentence, yes. Our submission is that the uh, defendants' allegations on these points are not grounded. If I may be of no further assistance, this concludes our submission. So, thank you, Council, and thank you, Councils, for this stimulating round of meeting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. so,